As you know, this is a class that we ask you to go through if you want to be involved in ministry here because we feel it's really important that you, uh, that we are all working off of the same value system. And it's not a given that you know, we could have very diverse backgrounds in the Lord. And this material has been really important to us from before we even came out here 22 years ago to start our church. We were already pretty steep into the details of the, the material, mostly because we needed it ourselves. My wife and I, you know, had to had to learn everything that we're trying to teach you that tonight, especially performance orientation, that our motive had to be pure in order to take the best care of God's people. And it's, um, I don't think it's usually even intentional if someone gets off track as a, as a leader, but we had to be very intentional to make sure that we didn't get off track because, like I said, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And we, um, we want to give you language for, let's just say, unhealthy striving as opposed to a heart that's just generous and wants to serve. And it's not always easy to, to separate those two things out. And, and that's why the analogy I liked is the fuel's in the engine. And if it's good fuel, we get good results. But if we're running on bad fuel, maybe some of our motives aren't where they need to be. It's not nothing wrong with serving, but if we're doing it out of fear, we're doing it because that's our identity, and if someone else comes along and is better at it, then, then we start to feel threatened, then that's a real problem. So as we're training people in leadership, once you join a ministry, you're going to serve under somebody, and you know you may not always agree 100% with what they're, what, what they're saying, but hopefully everybody's teachable, and we accept suggestions, and and when the goal is to see the kingdom advance, not king of kings necessarily, just by ourselves, but the kingdom to advance, that really helps. It's not to build my ministry, right? It's to build the kingdom of God in the earth. And our ministries are all different ways that he uses that. And we really want to honor everybody and, and not promote one gift over another. But, you know, in, in Ephesians 4.11, Apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. Those are all used to do what? To equip the saints for the work of the ministry. And if you find that sweet spot where you're really operating in the full gifting that God has for you, then we all win. And if you're not, then we're not winning like we could be. So we really want to make sure there's no Saul's armor. Right? David knew he was going to use a slingshot. And Saul didn't even have enough uh, awareness as the king to understand that. Thankfully, David did. <laughs> so we should get up some shirts, no Saul's armor, you know, put a big, big cross through that. That's our flesh, right? That just keeps trying to strive. So that's what we're going to talk about tonight. This is a really important topic. I'll just give you some of the quotes. This is what the Sanfords who wrote the book on it after 40 years in ministry and counseling thousands and thousands of people. Uh, through a prophetic anointing that they had, right? So that's different than just following a playbook and questionnaires. Prophetic counseling asks the Lord to come into every situation and give me the answer that this person needs right now. And we're all so different and fearfully and wonderfully made. We can't use formulas. It's different for every person. But God's power can help every person. Because he was present when you were conceived in your mother's womb. He knows everything about you. In fact, Jer Jeremiah, he said to Jeremiah, before you were even in your mother's womb, I had a calling on your life to be a prophet. So this is the way they described it. Performance orientation is a term which refers not to the service we perform, but to the false motives which fuel the energy of our service. Are you doing it just to be seen? Are you doing it because you need the pat on the back in order to feel good about yourself? All right, well, look, you know, nobody's got complete understanding of everything they're doing, but that wouldn't be real healthy because people are going to let you down, right? God won't, but people might. So if you've been in a situation where you feel like, wow, I thought things were going one way and I found out that that it wasn't going the way I thought and you feel a little resentment, remember this, everything that you gave, you gave to the Lord not to men. They're going to have to be accountable for what they did with what you gave to the Lord in their ministry. Vengeance is not mine, saith Peter Roselli. <laughs> right. 
having brought performance orientation to death, right? It doesn't say we fix it. What do we do? Crucify it. In us, it has to be crucified, not fixed. <laughs> Once we bring it to death, we may do the same exact works in the same way, but from a different intent in the heart. So different. If you're doing it out of fear because you have to keep up with the competition so you don't lose your slot, that's fear-based. If you're doing it from a love base, now you don't burn out when it's love. And you have boundaries. And you know when you need a break and you just go to the leader and say, hey, I've been running pretty hard. I need some time off. And if they say, there's no such thing as taking time off, <laughs> that's a problem. That's, that's an unhealthy culture, right? In bringing performance orientation to death, excuse me, we are not saying to stop serving or stop doing, but to die to the wrong hidden intents in, in our hearts. And boy, we think we know our hearts, but God will show us something new <laughs> often. James 3.16, that's the Lord's brother, right? And he's a pretty blunt guy. He says in James 3.16, 14 to 16, but if you have jealousy, envy, contention, rivalry, selfish ambition in your heart, okay, this is the Amplified, none of those are good words. Envy, jealousy, contention, rivalry, selfish ambition in your heart. And this can happen in a church. You can be in one of those annual business meetings and, and people are running for office. And they say all kinds of nasty things about their brothers and sisters. And you know, all these camps are forming or could be up on the worship team and feeling envious of somebody else's gift. And it just becomes very worldly. Instead of being grateful that there's more anointed musicians, right? King Saul could have been thrilled that God sent David to him. Could have just recognized the anointing on David's life and said, hey, you clearly have the anointing. I was hiding in the baggage when I found out I was supposed to be king. So let me just have a position in your cabinet and you be the king. Wow. I'll be the defense secretary. Because he was a warrior. But he was caught up in his flesh. And instead of being blessed by the gift of other people, he was threatened by it. And that's why people try to kill what they're threatened by. Wow. Don't have bitter jealousy in your hearts. Do not... Pride yourself. There's that word. That didn't take long to get there, did it? But I'm the worship leader here. No, you're not. That's not who you are first. That took a long time to develop that gift that he has. I'll tell you what. <laughs> because you can get proud in your gift because the world taught you before you got saved that you're performing. And everybody wants to be on you know, America's Got Talent or The Voice, and they want to win, they want to get the golden thing, whatever that is called, I don't even remember. I mean, that's awesome, but it could destroy your life if you don't know how to handle it, right. right? So don't pride yourself in the gift that God gave you. It's God that gave it to us, right? We're stewarding the gift that he gives us, and thus be in defiance of and false to the truth. This superficial wisdom is not such as comes down from above, but it's earthly, unspiritual, animal, even devilish and demonic. Wow. That's James, like I said. He doesn't pull any punches. He's not too worried about hurting somebody's feelings. He's just giving you the truth that that is out there. Don't bring what's out there in here. This is the altar where we lay that stuff down and we forgive people that hurt us, including people that might have hurt us in ministry. And you have to just say this, they did the best they could. And I might not think that was very good, what they did. They should have been able to do better. But look, that's not your deal to have to carry that load with you for the rest of your life. Let it go. Release them. Bless them. If they're still alive, say, Lord, bring a revival in their lives. Let, the, let their eyes be open and let them have a complete turn of their hearts. And maybe they'll apologize to me. Who knows? But I'm not sitting here waiting for that to happen because God's got another set of plans for me to do. And if I'm so stuck on being worried about what happened to me and they still owe me an apology, that's exactly what the devil wants to do is get us sidetracked on that stuff. Right. Then he finishes, James does, by saying, wherever there's jealousy and contention, rivalry, selfish ambition, there will also be confusion, unrest, rebellion, and all sorts of evil, vile practices. Wow. 
Doesn't sound like a good leadership training course, does it? We don't want confusion, rivalry, selfish ambition, confusion, or unrest. None of those things is the target that Jesus is helping us aim at. This teaching on performance orientation, this is what the Sanford said after 40 years, has been one of the most impactful of any we have done. There are many reasons for this, not the least of which is that every person suffers from this problem. Right. What? Yeah. What? Yeah. Every person that's ever been born suffers from this problem, and that's after a lot of credible years of ministry that they had. It might just be a tiny bit or a big amount, but that's okay. We, we have, there's sin in the world. That corrupted us, right? So if we were with Adam and Eve in the garden before they sinned, this wouldn't be true. But once sin came into the world, that, that corrupted our spirits. Thankfully, Jesus went to the cross to take the punishment, resurrected to defeat death, and then when he brought excuse me, his blood up onto the mercy seat in heaven, the Holy Spirit was allowed to be spread over the whole earth. I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. Yeah. Now he's in you. Now how much are you accessing what's already in you? Right? Like we sang it, calm down, spirit, move on us. But he's already in you. <laughs> so you could say, come out, spirit, too. Right? I mean, it's scriptural to say come down, too. But let's not undervalue what's already in us. And that's what I said. Grace is a supernatural ability God gives you to do things you couldn't do in your own strength. You go through a rough season and people will say, oh, God gave you the grace to get through that season. Because in your own strength, you wouldn't have been able to handle it. That's meant to encourage you. Not The fact that we all deal with this problem one way or another is meant to encourage you, not discourage you. We all have to fight the pull. It's like a gravitational pull of finding our identity in what we do. Can you look at somebody? Say, you are not what you do. You are a son or daughter of the living God. Your first identity is a son or daughter of the living God. That takes a lot of pressure off me. Tell me about yourself. I'm an accountant. Well, that's what you do for a living to pay your bills. But what about you? Who are you? <laughs> I, won't, I won't belabor that point too long. We had a man named Jack Frost that ministered here. I know that's kind of a funny name, right? But what a powerful ministry he had. He uh, had a very rough life. And it's going to be, I'll use a little bit of his life as an example. And I want to show a video here in a minute about that. But... The way I wrote it was, we'll look at his story to illustrate the dangers of performance orientation, okay? And like any child, Jack wanted his father's approval. So when he was told he was falling short of the goal, he did what most of us would do. What did he do? He, he tried harder, right? Now, that's, there's nothing wrong with that, right? As long as it's not out of fear. What's the motive? What's the fuel? Because fear will burn you out and you'll never get there. Whatever there is, the, the blessing is always just dangled a little bit further than you can get to. And if you start running faster, they turn up the speed of the treadmill. And it's just always out of the reach. That, I don't know if you ever saw the old pictures, but when they had a donkey, they would put a carrot out on the end of a stick. And poor thing, man, he just kept thinking he was going to get there. I just want to tell you, God takes that stuff really seriously. So we can't do that to each other. We can't poke at the fear of the person that they're going to need to feel good about themselves by what they do. That's violation. That's a big violation of what, how he wants us to treat each other. No fear. Perfect love casts out fear. Now, we should strive for a, fear, a, a spirit of excellence. That, that kind of striving is okay. If somebody's on the worship team, we, we expect them to practice before they get here. That's not fear. That's just wanting to please God. If you're teaching a Sunday school class, you're expected to prepare for the lesson, right? So there's a, there's a healthy amount of, of preparation. But then there's also that idea that unless the Lord builds the house, I'm just going to labor in vain. So I like to just say, hold on loosely. You know, do your work, prepare what you have to do, but then allow him to flow through you. 
and be spontaneous when you need to be. Not easy. So in this case, you know, we won't go into too much detail about his story, but his father was an orphan. And the father learned as a child, an, or, an orphan in, in the town that he was in, that if he could play sports really well, then he could get a reputation and that's how he was gonna feel good about himself. And you know, he, he did. And then he went into the army, into the military. And that's another place where if you work harder and, and, and you use fear tactics, you could get ahead pretty good. Just watch the drill sergeants in any military movie. They're not mercy motivated, those guys, right? So he and his brother were groomed by their dad to be tennis players. And look, that's fine. Sports is a great way to learn life lessons unless it's driven by fear. And those tennis players, they were expected to perform at a high level. But no matter how hard Jack tried at tennis, his father was never satisfied. And the father would always favor the brother over Jack. And I remember I, he stayed at our house when he was ministering here. He was writing a book and he had extra time to stay. We really got to know him well. And he said, I remember the day that I dropped that tennis racket. I walked off the court and I said, I am no longer my father's son. Wow. All right. And that's why the Bible says, do not provoke your children to anger. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. That's not your role. Yes, call out the gifts that's in them, but also compliment them. Speak blessing over them as well. If all you're ever doing is correcting them for things they're doing wrong, that's not a good formula. We need positive endorsement too. And speak over them, who, the, who you see them to be in God. Not you're a failure again, you're a failure again. That just completely robs us of hope. So what did he do? It's a common situation. It leads to self-hatred, anger, frustration, shame, resentment, and hopelessness. None of those are good. We all want to feel accepted, but when we're continually told we're failing, falling short, we can lose hope. So how did he act out his anger at his father? Like many people, by rebelling against authority, leaving his home as a teenager, he medicated the pain of rejection. Can you say that with me? He medicated the pain billions of times since Adam and Eve sinned. That has happened. Because we have a hard time facing the reality of the pain in our lives. So it's so easy to take a pill, to get involved, and just stay busy, become a workaholic. There's so many ways you can medicate your pain, but it's not helping you get to the root of the problem. It's compounding the problem, especially if it's controlled substances, or if it's dangerous sexual behavior, or so many ways the devil gets to steal, kill, and destroy. We're not called to medicate our pain. We're called to pray and ask the Lord to help us get through a tough situation. I believe that he will, right? He, he never gets you in a situation where he doesn't provide a way out. And that way out doesn't mean drink a quart of gin or, or, or whatever. I mean, in the moment, you're, you're feeling better because you're not having to think about it. Anybody ever hear of Russ Taft? You know who I'm talking about? There's a, an amazing documentary about that guy on, uh, I, don't, I don't know where it is, out on cable, wherever. And he was a really successful Christian singer, but his father was a bad alcoholic. Beat him on a regular basis. And the first, he never had a drink until he was an adult. And the first time he had one, and he felt that relaxation that comes, he said, oh, finally, I don't have to live in this pain anymore. And he thought it was a gift from God, but he became an alcoholic. And it's a great story. When I tell you a great story, he went to visit a man that had mentored him when he was younger who was dying of cancer. And before that man died, he spoke a father's blessing over Russ Taft, and that broke every form of addiction off him. Just one word from a father figure canceled all those years of the counterfeit version. Now, look, again, you can't blame your father if that was your dad because I'm back to saying he did the best he could. Because Russ Taft's father had to have been abused horribly in order for that to happen, right? And we can't walk in those guys' shoes and, and live in all this resentment and unforgiveness in our heart. That's a perfect plan of the enemy to just ruin us with that poison. So that's what, that's what he did. He got involved in all kinds of addictions. Thinking, you know, I'll show you in a minute. He lived on the coast of North Florida and eventually made his livelihood as a commercial fisherman where he drove himself to be to be called the top 
hook. Another day's story, but that meant when you came into the dock, they weighed the amount of your catch, and the goal was to always have the most pounds of fish. And he was consistently the top hook, but he was burning himself out, and his crew called him Captain Bly. <laughs> and if you saw the movie Perfect Storm, that's what happened. He kept them out too long when a storm was coming, and they almost all died, right? Yeah, so wow, what is the penalty for living in this fear of not being accepted by other people? Because we don't really fully understand the love of God for us. Sounds easy, it's not easy. Thankfully, the Lord broke through all his pain, and he impacted thousands of people before he passed away. So can we, can we show that video now? Great, thank you. Let's have a hand for the people in the booth. Hallelujah. And we went to Bible school, and, and, and I need a strong young man to help me with this. Where's a strong, strong young man? Strong young man. Come on, come on, come, come on. He, he, he likes the word young. He's jumping up there right now. <laughs> and so, so this, this is the New Testament Christian. I mean, he gets born again, just radical for Jesus, so excited, so full of the love of God. But so, so this was me when I went to Bible school. I mean, I am just totally sold out and so excited about God. But we got there, and I didn't know what a Christian should do. And so the first week, they start teaching us what, if you're going to be a good Christian and you're going to be a pastor of a church, there's a lot of things you should do in order to be holy, in order to, 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 to increase in the anointing. The first thing they taught us was about a whole life dedicated to prayer. But they didn't count on my filter system. Keep in mind, I was completely born again radically, set free of drug addiction just like that. Never picked it up again. The day I got saved, February 16, 1980, I've not touched pornography again for 21 years. Set free like that was a pornography addict. Set free of alcohol addiction. I mean, so radically saved that old things have passed away and all things have become new. My spirit man was new in Christ. But what about the mind, willing emotions? What about the thinking process? And see, the filter of the thoughts was, I've got to hit the ball right. And if I'm hitting the ball right, oh, if I'm not. And so they taught us this wonderful discipline of prayer. And it was the first week they gave us the discipline of prayer. And it was a wonderful, beautiful, beautiful discipline of learning to get up at least 30 minutes early every day because they taught us if you can't, if you can't tarry, if you can't spend 30 minutes or an hour a day with the Lord, then, then you're not going to be a very good pastor. You're just not a good Christian. And I started thinking and calculating, well, if 30 minutes a day makes me anointed, what will an hour a day? Because remember, i got to be up here. I got to be more anointed than everybody else, especially since I was about 10 years older than everybody else in this Bible school. I've got to be more anointed. So I started getting up an hour earlier and spending an hour a day with the Lord. And then the next week they gave us a seminar on the Word that, that any good Christian, they gave you the piece of paper, you've got to read your Word through every year, and here's your three chapters, and you've got to check them off. And so... Well, if three chapters a day makes me anointed, what will ten chapters a day do? I'm going to read it three times through in a year. So they gave me the discipline of prayer. And that was a wonderful discipline, but they didn't count. They didn't count on the filter system. In fact, the theology was once you got saved, you got it all. And there's truth to that. But there's also things in our life that exalt itself above the knowledge of God. And then they took us out on the streets in, the, in this big city in the south, and you had to witness every Friday for six hours. And they told us the whole thing of evangelism. And, and any good Christian is going to witness, and he's got to get out there and buttonhole people. And then on Mondays, they'd come in and they'd give a report about who, who witnessed to the most people and who won the most souls of the Lord. And so they had kind of a list, whoever did and whoever didn't. So this one was trouble for me because I was shy. I could not talk to people. I was an introvert. And so they told us this whole thing of evangelism and witnessing. But I worked at it as hard as I could. I did everything they said I should do. 
and, and, and I got it down, but I didn't win as many souls, but I tried real, real hard. But then, but see, they also po posted all the grades on the bulletin board. Yeah. And they had those that were at the top, and they had those who were at the bottom. I just couldn't stand being 10 from the top. It just said, just tear me up. I've got to get, so I've got to get up earlier to study, to show myself approved by God. And so I went to work on that one, okay? Let me get this discipline. I've got the study to show my proof, self proof for God. Well, I got close to the top. I never got to the top, but I got close to the top. But see, then they send you out to pastor a church when you graduate. And if your church is not bearing fruit, then you must not be hitting the ball right. And so you've got to bear good fruit. And if the church is not growing and you'd turn in your numbers every month and you'd send them to headquarters. And if your numbers were going up, you got a little letter that just said how much they loved you and how good you were doing. And it was just wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> but if your numbers were going down, they put you on the list. <laughs> How many have been on the list before? <laughs> I'm not going to tell you the first word, but... <clears throat> well, I got it down. <laughs> By now, I learned... <laughs> But now I learned how anointed I was praying an hour, so I started getting up 4.30 every morning, spending the first three hours a day in the Lord. I was spending two hours in prayer, one hour in the Word, reading nine chapters a day in the Word, two hours of prayer. I was going out on the streets evangelizing, going into the projects evangelizing. The first year, I had the fastest growing church in North and South Carolina, in our whole district, the fastest growing church. So they brought me up on the platform during the minister's conference, and they gave me this wonderful plaque <laughs> that just told me how wonderful I was doing. <laughs> but the thing is, <laughs> you've got to do as well next year. Do you, do you, if you drop any of that, you're going to hell. You know that now, don't you? <laughs> do you realize when you're getting up in the morning and you're putting in all this effort to hit the ball right so that somebody loves you and respects you, when you come home about 7 or 8 o'clock at night, you don't have any energy left to love. Because all your energy is going into juggling all these things that religion has told you you should do. <laughs> you see? Do you know God loves you? <laughs> do you need to get free? Somebody help this young, this young man out get free. Thank you so much. <laughs> Okay, you can stop it. I think the point was made. I never forgot that one, boy. So, um, I'm not crying. I'm just hot. You know, what can I tell you? <laughs> I know you're not hot. But, uh, the thing is, as this revelation was hitting me, I, you know, married to Trisha, she'd been counseling before, um, before I was even saved. She got saved before I was and then got right into a, a really strong ministry. And she dealt with a lot of these things before I had. And I mean, she was maybe three years before I got saved. So it was a long enough time that she had a good grounding. And um, you know, my wife is gonna do it. If she's gonna do it, she's all in. She's not gonna do anything halfway. So she handed me a cassette tape. Does anybody know what a cassette tape is? That's how old, uh, how long ago that was. You have a bunch of people at home looking it up online now. What's a cassette tape? And I popped it in, and it was on this performance orientation was the first one. And now, again, I, I played high school football. I was a musician. So all those things are ripe with potential to be, to have fear to be used as the tactic, not love, right? Like, especially football, middle linebacker. Like, you, you know, you got to be the toughest guy on the field. You can't complain. It's just a bunch of garbage, frankly. I mean, I like the fact that it taught me a lot about life, but... It's all about your motive, okay? 
And, and uh, the first time I heard it, and it was like a light was going on in my head, and I'm like, oh, that's what they were doing to me. I was being played to just try to be better than everybody else because they got something out of it, but they didn't care if I got hurt or injured or whatever. Anybody else play football? Yeah, I mean, it's a pretty rough game. And I remember the coach saying to me, you got to learn the difference between pain and injury. <laughs> Everything was just pain. Nothing was an injury. You know, get back out there, you'll be fine kind of thing, right? And you had to be the man, right? You couldn't complain. And then music, right? Recitals and practicing and, you know, my father was like, hey, you know, I'm paying money for those lessons playing the accordion, of course, I'm Italian. And I didn't want to play the accordion, but that's what they wanted me to do. And I'm thinking, man, oh, he's got a bad temper. I better do this lesson right. And I'm like playing through tears. <laughs> yeah, I, I know. I hope you feel really bad for me. No, kidding. <laughs> but uh, the Beatles came on Ed Sullivan, and I'm like, Dad, no accordions in this band. Look at how those girls are acting. The guitar is the key. <laughs> so, you know, it just built in so many different ways. Women with your body image, nobody's perfect enough, nobody, whatever. They set the bar so high, you can't get there. And money, right? I had a client, I, I, I invest money for people, and so I deal with wealthy people and successful people. And, I'll never forget it. One guy said, I love my boat. I used to take it out on Barnegat Bay all the time, and I loved my boat until a bigger boat came by, and then I hated my boat. <laughs> like, if that doesn't sum it up, boy, right there, you never get there, whatever there is. So you're doing it, and you look yourself in the mirror, and I like the way Teddy Roosevelt said, if you want to check this out, it's a great speech he gave. It's called The Man in the Arena. And ultimately, it's saying, as long as you know that you left everything on the field, you're not going to win every game. You just don't want it to be because you didn't give it your best effort, right? And that's what you should tell your children about their studies, and they're not going to be great in every subject, right? So look, you want to be real careful about not shaming people to try to get them to perform better. It works well in the short run, but it builds up this toxic performance orientation that I've never seen a better illustration, so hopefully you'll never forget that picture of Jack Frost, because that's the last thing we would ever want to do here to somebody. And, and if you're gifted, it's probably easier for that to happen, because people can exploit you for your gift. All right, so in Ephesians it says, for by grace you've been saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of, come on, works. See how this could creep in, right? Well, if God loves me this much by being in one ministry, he'll love me more if I be in five ministries. Your wife and kids won't love you more because you're never home, but I'm doing it for the Lord. See, I mean, there's a lot of pain around that right there. So let's be careful. We can't earn our salvation, I'm sorry, our way to salvation by performing. And think of grace, I said this already, as God's empowering gift that allows you to do what you could not do on your own, just like somebody says, he gave me the grace to get through that season. Well, he gives us the grace to get through life. What can you do to make God love you more? Say it out loud. No. Louder. Nothing. Hope everybody at home hears you. We say nothing is a good answer. But understanding this with our mind is not enough. It's not sufficient. Faith allows us to believe before we see the change. So if you're dealing with this, and, and that's really what I was trying to get to before when she gave me that cassette tape, I started getting angry at the people that I saw, I thought about, you know, and I had to pull my car over because I didn't want to, you know, I didn't want to get too distracted while I was driving. And, and, and I just had a, a pad in my car, and I started writing down all the people that had done things to me like this uh, up to that point in my life. And it was like, wait a minute, they were playing me. Like, they were using me for their reputation, and, and they always were dangling that carrot. They never said it was good. I could have done 20 things right, but the one thing I did wrong, that's all they focused on. And like I said before, you go in, you watch the films of the game before, and they would keep replaying your mistakes. <laughs> Roselli, what were you thinking? <laughs> right? So the best thing that could happen is you didn't hear your name once in the film session. Because they never said, oh, look at what a good play Roselli made. That was just expected. Get it? Ugh. 
So you may deal with some anger. It's, we're, we're, that's the main reason I was trying to make that point is that may get stirred up in you and you've got to forgive them. Like, don't hold on to unforgiveness. When I tell you, it's a huge stumbling block. And don't try to do things to prove that somebody who said something about you, you're never going to amount to anything. Your fuel should not be, I'm going to prove them wrong. It's fear again. It's fear falling short. No, I'm comfortable in who God may be to be. He knows my real identity. The more time I spend with him, you know, I love what the words of that song, I'm sorry, when I was just going through the motions and I forgot that you're enough, right? I want you, nothing else, you. I don't need man's approval. I don't want to offend people, but my main goal can't be to worry about what other people think of me. And Paul said that in Galatians. Oh, foolish Galatians, who has deceived you? Who has bewitched you? You started out by grace. Now you're trying to earn it again. And that's what had happened. That's what always happens to religiously minded people. You just have to keep working more and working harder. So I'm going to read this quickly. It says that knowing, the, the knowing that we have to have has to transfer from our mind into the deeper levels of our heart. There's got to be an unshakable faith that we're unconditionally loved by the Father. And you may think you are there, that's great, but then Holy Spirit will bring something up where you realize you do still have some striving in your life, potentially. And, and that's about like peeling back the onions. It's not a huge, horrible problem, but there's still traces of it in there sometimes. And, and if you're married, you give your spouse permission. If you see me, that's what John and Paul used to do, her code word was, if you see me shifting into gear, you could just put your hand on my shoulder and I'll know that means I gotta, I gotta wind it down a little bit because that was her problem. She was really driven by what everybody thought and she, she took on everything in their church and, and, and she, was, she created a culture where everybody was afraid to get involved because they didn't think they were gonna ever do it good enough, right? Anyway, that's, it's, it's really worth digging in on this particular topic in the book and I can give you more and I did give you more and we'll get to that before 11 o'clock tonight, I promise. <laughs> when we cannot fully grasp that truth, performance orientation becomes defiling and it's a poison inside of us. It's easy to see how this modern culture that we live in breeds performance orientation right into children. Even if the parents are not as severe as Jack Frost's parent, father was especially, piano lessons, you know, all these things that I've already touched on. What is the church that Jesus desires, right? He said, the gates of hell will not prevail against my church, his church, not Peter and Trisha's church, right? Roselli Global Ministries, nah, no thanks. I don't need that. I just want to be ha have him be happy when I stand before him someday. The best thing he could say is, you took good care of my kids. You helped them grow into who I wanted them to be, not your Saul's armor version. <laughs> he desires people who cooperate and co-labor together, labor, excuse me, together to build a healthy community filled with unconditional love, winning the lost, and growing Christians into mature believers. And one of the ways that translated when we first started the church was like, look, we're not going to have 50 ministries. We're going to start slow and we're going to grow healthy. So we don't want to just say that we have a choir to say that we have a choir. God will provide people. And as they're coming in, we'll see what their gifts are. And that's how the ministries will develop. We're not going to start by saying we have this checklist and you have to try and do it and you've got to help us. You know, I get it. the motivation was what he said. You had to be the fastest growing church in the region because you've got to report your numbers and, you, you know, whatever. I, we, we didn't have that particular problem. We didn't have any financial support, so we just had to figure it out. But that was okay. The point is, though, you start, you go to a pastor's luncheon, and what's the first question they ask you? How many people in your church? Right, first thing. I won't go there. Be bleeding all over the altar up here. <laughs> The church Jesus desires does not want, want us to cultivate a competitive culture. When competition arose among the disciples, you may remember this, Jesus was quick to identify it and correct it, right? You remember in Matthew 20, the mother of Zebedee's sons came to him with her sons, kneeling down and asking something from him. Jesus said, what do you wish? She said, grant that these two sons of mine may sit, one on your right hand 
and the other on the left hand in your kingdom. And this is what I picture, like, the other apostles are over on the side here, and they're like, wait a minute, what? Are, they brought their mother? What? They need their mommy to talk to Jesus? That's what would have happened on the football team. I promise. Grant that these two sons of mine, oh, Verse 24, when the ten heard it, they were not happy. They were greatly displeased, displeased with the two brothers. But Jesus called them to himself and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. Can we just say pull rank? We pull rank. We don't pull rank over each other in the church. That's not this kingdom. But it still creeps in. It's a creep. Get rid of the creeps. The rulers of the Gentiles lord over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. Amen. Different kingdom. Amen. Yes. King of all kings is a foot washer. That's upside down, isn't it? By the world's definition. Yet it shall be not be so among you, but whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. And in Philippians, this is how Paul said it, let this mind be in you, that was also in Christ, but I really like this translation. He says, this is how you should think among yourselves, with the mind that you have, because you belong to Jesus Christ as your Lord, Messiah. Who, though in God's form, did not regard his equality with God as something he ought to exploit. That is a good way to say it. He didn't pull rank on people. But he could have, couldn't he? Right, like, you don't, you're going to let me kill you, Jesus? And he says, you're not killing me. I'm voluntarily giving my life over. If I wanted to. I could call a legion of angels down right now, and you'd be toast. <laughs> You're not taking my life from me. I'm giving it. And he didn't even pull a rack there, did he? He would never had a bad day and just decided to make it easy because he had the Father's nature, and that's sin. It's not that he didn't correct people either, right? So he was angry. He, he was firm when he had to be. He confronted sin. He told the woman caught in adultery, don't sin anymore. Stop this sinful lifestyle or it's going to get worse. But he could do that with love and because he was credible with them. We don't have to pull rank. He didn't think his rank equal to God allowed him to take advantage of people. He washed their feet. Whoa. It's the last thing he did with them. And he said, I'm leaving an example for you. As I've done to you, you go do for others. And I quoted it last week or recently, Sunday I guess it was, right? Like, this is my commandment, that you love one another the way I loved you. So look, we're going we're gonna to make mistakes in ministry. We're going to have a bad day sometimes, but just repent. Just go to the person and say, you know, I'm really sorry. This happened to me on the worship team one time. I was just getting a little short with the drummer at the time. And, uh, and I, I went to him and said, you know, I'm really sorry after the rehearsal. That, the way I came across is not who I want to be. Will you forgive me? And then, you know, he was smart enough not to say, oh, it was no big deal. Because that's not true. It was a big deal. And I knew, I knew by the look on his face that it was a big deal. And he said, oh, thank you. That really means a lot to me that you would say that. Right? And, and, and why do they think we're hypocrites, half the people in the world? It's because we don't always do what we say we do. And they're looking. They have this, like, little meter on the inside. Is their walk matching their talk? Or are they just religious about this whole thing? It's, it's living it out that gives the best sermon that you could ever give, right? So look, you know, really look for this in your life. If, if you're not accepting your identity as a son or daughter of God, that means there's something else that's taken that place. And you need to bring that down. That's, that's, that's idolatry. Instead of pulling rank, <laughs> he emptied himself and received the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of humans, and then having human appearance, he humbled himself and became obedient even unto death, even the death of the cross. Woo! So he leaves heaven in this perfect place, voluntarily comes down here, is spit upon, beard pulled out, like treated like trash, and said, Father, forgive them, 
They know not what they do. For the joy that was set before him, that we would be here tonight trying to imitate that amazing Savior and not being able to do it without his help, right? And so God has greatly exalted him, and to him, in his, in his favor, has given him the name which is above every name. And you know the rest of it, that at the name of Jesus, come on, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Okay, let's keep going. I gave you a handout, right? And I'm going to ask Christine to come up for a minute before we get into this. Uh, this is Christine's recent post on Facebook. She got a lot of comments about this, this one. Everybody say hi, Christine. Hi. Sam, come up. Yo, two become one, man. Two become one. Look at that foxy lady that you married, man. That's, that's good stuff. <laughs> and well, we go way back, right? Like yeah. about 30 years maybe, right? Yeah. yeah. We've known each other a really long time. And uh, she had a revelation this week about uh, her life. And I, and I asked her if she'd be willing to share it. So go for it. Um. I'm just blown away that Jack Frost seeing that, and I was not putting the dots together. So when I was a child, I, I must have been about 13, 14, and I remember my dad saying, you know, honey, you're getting a little, mm, you better watch what you're eating, you better take care, you know, take it easy a little bit. And I took that in as rejection. And as a child, you're not thinking these thoughts, this is rejection, you're like, so I immediately just stopped eating. And then I, as I was progressively growing into my teens, I learned bulimia. And I struggled with bulimia for 19 years. And they were ready to put me in the hospital. And I said to my mother, before you do that, because at that point I was 98 pounds. And I was in the bathroom more than seven, eight hours a day, and that's even at work. I would sneak into the bathroom and, you know, let go of the lunch. And it got so intense that the bones in my shoulders were showing. I mean, it was just horrible, horrible. And um, I got to a place where I said to my mother, you know what, I'm going to go to that church that Steve went to years ago because I'm not going into a hospital. But what I wasn't connecting was I was going in performance. And the bulimia was a carrier to get you to love me. And I remember going to job interviews, and at that point I was working in corporate, and whether I was the receptionist or customer service, I overheard the manager say, get her. She's going to be the billboard for this company. She's perfect. And the perfect girl had to go into the perfect clothes and the most expensive jewelry, the best hair, the best everything that you would go, wow. And that was the only way. That's where I identified love. But I wasn't connecting the dots because prior to salvation and even knowing what Pastor Pete is teaching, it's an addiction, well, it was more than just an addiction. It was my way of getting you to love me. And those identifications of love and the performance got so out of control that it, it, it got me down to 98 pounds soaking wet. But I also, which I said to Pastor Pete, I have to say this. We, Pastor David taught on forgiveness last week, and it's so important. And even to the point where he said, which is so true, it heals you, but it also heals the other person. And in our other church, we were groomed. Now, I came out of that real Italian home where you were loyal and loyalty even undeserved. So I was groomed in that. And we were taught that you protect the pastor at any cost. And I did. And I went after my spiritual father. All right. We're good. I know. We're so good. And we, um, I was so broken and traumatized back then, coming into 
king of kings, and we sat in a room, and he, I saw him, he had to forgive me because I attacked him because I thought he was the bad guy. And because of his forgiveness, I'm here. And God healed. So please understand the power of forgiveness to the other person is also going to heal them because he laid out that place of forgiveness to be a father to me and a real father because I never had a man's love like this. Like a father, I mean. And because of that, God put connections that I had in her healing because I got delivered over and over and over again in our old church, but we never got to the roots of what was causing this addiction, what was causing me to run into this place to be 98 pounds. And, and I've got to say this, I stopped the bulimia after I was in my old church, but there were so many diets, hours of working out. I mean, to the point I broke blood vessels in my eyes to be that perfect body image uh, three four hours in the gym until I went oh my gosh this is performance and I got to deal with this and it's not only going to creep in diets and body image it will creep into the church into your business into your relationships so thank you awesome. thank you wait 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 <laughs> So Sam had a similar journey and now understands the love of the Father in a way that you never have. You want to just give a minute on that? Sure. Okay, so obviously, as far as God is concerned, there was a revelation God gave me today. Jesus was able to accomplish what he was called to do because of the love of the Father and nothing else. He was able to be himself and his son to the Father and he was able to accomplish everything he was able to do. And from my life, I had to encounter God. I was in a cycle that I constantly went into the same problem and the same sin and the same issue, struggled and struggled to the point it was like I just couldn't do it anymore. I said, like, when is this going to be over? How can I stop this garbage to the point where God had to snap me out of it and then all of a sudden I realized, wait a minute, he's the only one who can break you out of those cycles of addiction, the cycles of destruction, Right, so when I'm when he when I started encountering him, understanding that his heart is what I was hurting, I couldn't just stop on my own. It had to be him loving me and putting his love in that place. That lady on, on the, the at the well, what I realized about that when God showed me about that, what, what God showed me about that was God embraced her for who she was. That's why she was able to stop the sin. She was finally out of that cycle and accept it for who she was. And it's like, wow, I'm truly loved. Yeah. And then it's like, I got to go tell everybody about the Lord. And that's what broke that cycle. And it's only God. God, it, it's, life is about the love of God. That's all it is. And it's so hard to do, but it's worth it. It's yeah. worth it. Amen. You guys did a lot of hard work. Hey, I'm going to put Tim on the spot. I just had the picture while they were talking of that picture of the heart. Do you mind just coming up and giving a quick testimony about how God has used this in your life too? Everybody say hi to Tim Page. Oh, your wife needs to come up too to become one. <laughs> he could do all the talking. Uh... Hello. <laughs> so uh, it was probably about six or eight weeks ago. Um, I was in, um, it was actually a heart healing session with someone. And I was kind of, uh, you know, I've been through so many sessions and experiences and um, so I have this appointment set up to go into a heart healing, and, and this guy uh, is, is leading me, in, and I'm in my mind, I'm in, I'm in prayer, and he's, he's saying the statement, what I want you to do is, is to give your heart to the Lord. And, you know, I'm kind of 
trying to process, okay, when I got saved, I did that, you know, when, when I went through this um, experience of healing, I did that, uh, when I was in this session, I did that, and so I'm thinking to myself, okay, just do it, <laughs> just do it one more time, and so I'm like, okay, Jesus has my heart. And the guy says to me something that just kind of like blew my mind. He said, I want you to see Jesus in your heart. And a couple minutes went by, and I, and I really felt like Jesus came into my heart. And then he said, when, when you're ready, I would like you to take your heart back from him. And I said, man, do you know how long it took me to get to this point? I don't want my heart back. I want him to keep it. And, and that was a revelation that it, to this day, it, it's not my heart or his heart, but he's in my heart, and that's where I want to keep it. So thanks. Can you wait, though, one more minute? Do you mind just talking a little bit about understanding the love the, that your identity is first as a son of God and maybe even how your own story would have impacted that? Yeah, this is a good one. Hold on. Um, so, uh, so I got saved in 1983. I was in a county jail in upstate New York. Um, and from 83 to um, 96... I just kind of lived my life. Um, it wasn't like I was a backslider. I hadn't actually come in yet, you know. Um, I wasn't discipled. I wasn't fellowshipping. And in 96, when I came into fellowship, I, um, the, the thing that I, like, loved the most was worship. I mean, when you're out in the wilderness... And for me, I was like taking a lap, and there's the promised land, and I take another lap, and there's the promised land, I'm back in the wilderness. And to come into fellowship and to give my life into worship was the best. It was the cherry on top. However, all that time, I still didn't, um, I still didn't have the, the deliverances and, and the breaks from all that stuff. And finally, in the year 2000, I, I end up going into uh, something very similar to uh, the Sanfords. It was called Restoring the Foundation. And, you know, I did uh, five weeks of three hours of intense going through A to Z with two brothers. And um, I remember we were in the, the soul and spirit hurt section. And, you know... Just to back up, I was raised by a single parent. I'm an only child and had come through uh, uh, age four uh, sexual abuse and then parental abuse because when my mom married my stepfather, he had two failed marriages and, you know, I was his scapegoat. Um, very brutal um, physically, emotionally, mentally, uh, really tough. And so um, one point in my life, I'm at a babysitter's house, four, four years old or so, and I had soiled myself, and she put a diaper on me, and her father was still alive, and I was like, I'm not letting him see me like this. No way. So I went to a sofa that had a pile of clothes on it, and I crawled underneath the pile of clothes, and they're all over the house. Where are you? It's time to eat. Let's go. And... It was at that point that they said, all right, we don't know where he is. Let's just go eat. And that's where the spirit of rejection and abandonment came in, you know. And it was kind of like, you know, I didn't want her father to see me. He was the only father figure I knew at that point. And I'm like, no way am I showing up in these things, you know. A diaper? Are you kidding me? I mean, this is like a four-year-old processing this stuff. Like, no way am I going to let him see me like this. So... Fast forward to tw uh, the year 2000, I'm going through the soul and spirit hurts, and I'm in prayer, and all of a sudden I have this open vision, and I'm standing in that room, 
and I'm looking at myself on that sofa underneath the pile of clothes. And the presence of the Lord comes in next to me and says, I'm the father to the fatherless. Broke it, just like that. Broke it, just like that. The rejection, the abandonment, the, the shame, the guilt, just like that. Now, it takes a lot of work to maintain that and to stay in that place. But I'll tell you, it was like, it took me a long time to get there. And, you know, just kind of one of those things that freedom, yeah, freedom. So do me a favor. You never met your earthly father, right? Your natural father? No idea. Never met his, his earthly father, but he's been delivered from an orphan spirit. So could you just release that to people, mm. the healing that you've received? Mm. Tell them what you do for a living now. Um, you don't want me to tell them who I am? You want me to tell them what I do? No. I, 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 he, he do he's, he's an example of Romans 8, 28, what the devil meant for evil, yeah. God turns it around for good. Yeah, yeah. It's not who you are. It's just what you yeah, do. I know. I just busted on you. You're good. That's a good joke. <laughs> Uh, I've, uh, uh, for 25 plus years, I'm a, uh, substance abuse counselor, therapist, um, yeah. Whom the sun sets free is free indeed. So Father, I just, uh, speak to, to the heart that's crying out to you. Father, the, the heart and the life that's here tonight that is, um, striving and pressing and searching for a way to be connected to you. Father, I just declare a breaking through all of that and that your presence would penetrate their mind, their heart, their soul, their life, their speech, everything, Lord God, invade them, invade them in Jesus' name. And Father, in the name of Jesus and by the authority that he's given to me, I break the orphan spirit in this room. Everyone in here is not an orphan. He is the father to the fatherless that we can cry out, Abba, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thank you. Love you. So, um, you know, there's real power in testimony. And... You just saw people that have overcome like really big obstacles. And I don't think any of them would tell you that they're done, that they've arrived. None of us are ever going to fully arrive, right? We're not going to be hanging on a cross and saying, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do, but that doesn't matter. It doesn't mean you don't keep trying. And that's the, that's the thing, is that you can get up every day and... Uh, Believe that he's going to work something in your life that day that gets you closer to be more like him. And then this beautiful thing, the Holy Spirit starts showing you what the obstacles are. And then you just say, I turn it over. I don't want to fix it. I'm going to crucify it, bring it to the altar, Lord. I have to have enough faith to believe that whatever I look like on the other side of the crucifixion, I'm going to feel like a newbie. I don't know how to act that new way, but you're going to help me because you're a good father. And I don't have to worry about that. And I'm not going to worry about pleasing everybody and how, what they think about me. Because I'm, I enjoy being around people who are comfortable in who they are and aren't trying to impress everybody. I hope you are too. So what this is, the one that had the circle on it, that, that last one I showed you before, Christine's picture, excuse me, is, is, is really good to, to, watch, to look at this. And if you're watching online, we can email you this. So just email us, info at kingofkingswc.com, and we'll send you the handouts and the slides from tonight. I'll just go through it quickly. If you look at, this, uh, imagine it's a clock, you know, go to 12 o'clock, and it says you're on top of the world because you, you made it down to 98 pounds and everybody's complimenting you on how good you look, you think, you know, if it's uh, in Christine's story. And then the spirit, you know, when you get to 1 o'clock, it's like, ah, the spirit asks, is, it, is this really working? And that's not the Holy Spirit, okay? <laughs> it's that spirit of death. And then disillusionment around 3 o'clock causes performance to wane. And then whatever you were doing before to earn love isn't working anymore. Because you're running out of fuel and now it's 4 o'clock. And then by 6 o'clock, you're in a black hole. Because nothing that you're doing is working anymore. So what do you say at 7.30? <laughs> Maybe if I do something, people will like me again. 
And then all of a sudden, they do start liking you again. So things are getting better. And I've done what Jack Frost did. Well, if that got me some love, if I do more, then I'll get love again. More love, more work. And then I'm back at, on top of the world. But because it was never authentic to begin with, it can't last. And if you're motivating people by fear, it can't last. You're going to burn them out. Perfect love casts out fear. We don't shame people in order to get them perform, to perform better, even though it might work in the short run. Here's something to meditate on during the week, the one that says uh, performance orientation group discussion. Do this on your own or with people you love that you, that you trust and, and just work through some of these causes and, and look if there's any symptoms in your life when you find yourself striving. And look, often it could be when you get around people like Thanksgiving dinner is like notorious for unhealthy family behavior, right? Or Italian weddings, you know, like takes five hours to figure out who can sit with who because of all the grudges people are holding against each other. And, and it ruins the wedding for some people, like because they've got to just present the exact right image and say the exact right thing. But if I'm so worried, you know, <laughs> about what everybody thinks about me when I'm with my boss, I've got to present this way, but then when I'm with oh, my coworker, I've got to present this way, and then the people who work for me, I've got to look a different way. I go to the Christmas party, and how, who the heck am I? Because all of them are in the room. I go hide in the bathroom, because none of them are the real me. Brutal, horrible, exhausting way to live. You can't ever keep that devil happy about that. And then, again, this, uh, some closing thoughts, just some good ideas, and again, questions for review that you can look at. And I'd like to end as a group with the prayer for striving. But if you're on the prayer ministry team, please come up now, okay? Because, not, what, 8.52, so this is when we want to wind down and start praying. So anybody on the back row there willing to come up and pray? I sure hope they say yes. <laughs> and they're coming. <laughs> Everybody want to stand? And it'll take a little bit, but it's good to read it out loud. <clears throat> it's good to uh, make this confession out loud together. Amen? So you got the one that says a prayer to end striving? All right. Let's read it out loud together. Ready? Lord, I have come to see my performance orientation. I confess to you that although my head believes salvation is by grace, my heart drives me to earn favor to be good enough to present myself to others and to you. I admit that I cannot change myself. The fear of not being accepted or loved is so overwhelming, it puts me into gear and I begin performing again. When acceptance is given with no strings attached, I cannot receive it. I ask you into my heart to do the work in me, for me. Bring my striving to death. I want to rest in your love. Help me remove the hindrances I have erected which prevent me from entering into your love. Lord, I have been angry with you for putting me into this family, this position, I don't want my anger to keep me from you, so I ask that you restore my heart. I forgive my, forgive my family for, and then obviously that's a fill in the blank, and, and the Lord will reveal things to you over time as you pray into this. Ready? I ask your forgiveness for my angry responses, my fear and insecurity, my impure motives, and for not believing the truth. Lord, I renounce the family lies. Again, that's something you're gonna have to pray into. And, and be specific and name them and renounce them. And I accept my identity as your child. Help me learn how to live that identity in my daily life. Help me to feel, to know within me that success is simply being your child. Help me to be like you, Lord. I ask you to bring to death in me the structures, the habit patterns of performing that I have created. You list them out. I ask you to minister to the ambivalence in me when I want correction but cannot receive it. 
or when I want and need compliments but cannot believe them. Likewise, be the Lord of my tongue so that wisdom and kindness permeate the corrections and the compliments I give. Help me to take my eyes off my needs and fears. Lord, this is a good one. Lord, I resign from managing the universe. <laughs> I give to you my compulsive need to control people and situations. I recognize I have wounded, and now they go again, fill it in, pray into it, by not affirming their contributions. I always had to edit, add, or correct. I could always do it better. Forgive me, Lord, for both my insecurity and my arrogance, as well as for the wounds I have caused. Help me to believe I am not responsible for all that goes on around me. Forgive me for always being a Martha and help me to hear when you call me to be Mary. Show me where I have taken on jobs or duties for the wrong reasons and give me the wisdom to resign from them if necessary. Help me to fall in love with you, Jesus, so that what others think of me is not important. You have said that it is you working in us that enables us first to will and then to act according to your good purposes. I want to be a good workman, but only with your strength, your will. Help me, Lord, be like you. Amen. Hopefully, you could understand why I would want you to go through this material before you join a ministry here, right? Because some of you were busy in other churches. You came here for one reason or another, and you're wondering, well, what's taking so long? I want to get involved. Well, we want you to get involved, but we want you to have a little breather first to have a chance for some self-examination and soul care and just to make sure that, our, that our, we get a reset so that the reason that we're doing it is for the right reasons and not because we need the accolades of, of other people. Amen? So I just want to speak a blessing over you and anybody who's watching online. Lord, I thank you for the hungry hearts of everybody that's here tonight. I thank you that we are all seeking to be men and women after your own heart. None of us are perfect. We recognize that. But we also know that we serve you in your perfection. And you love us. And because you love us, you will reveal those besetting sins, those things that are slowing us down. Give us the courage <coughs> excuse me, to face them, to not be afraid of the truth, and then to have the courage to work through those issues with people who love us and have no other agenda than to want to see us become more like you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.